My name is Ted Helms. I'm with the uh, Executive Director of the Brazilian American Chamber of Commerce. Um, first, I want to thank uh, Focus Level for the use of their space and for being the primary organizer of this event. I first met with Evan way back in March. We were planning an event, so I want to finish our the build out of our uh, of our space first, and then we'll do something. So. It's finally happened, and thank goodness we did wait, because if we put this at the chamber, we'd be all scrunched together, sitting uh, in the little row seats and trying to eat our sandwich. So this is really quite elegant and spacious. Also, thanks to Marco Filio, uh, also co-sponsor, for making this event happen. Uh, this event, like all our others, are an integral part of the chamber activities, which is to our mission of promoting trade, investment, and understanding uh, between the two nations. Um, Hi, uh, my name is Evan Koster. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to uh, I also want to thank uh, the Chamber and in particular Ted for, for his uh, efforts in uh, bringing this all together, um, which has, uh, I think, taken since, since January of last year, and we deferred it and deferred it until uh, we had uh, moved to the space, which was supposed to be in, in December of last year. But, uh, we're finally here, uh, and, and uh, uh, thanks to Ted, and, and also want to give a shout out to Ted for his years of service to uh, to the chamber and to the dedication to the uh, Here today we, we have 39 transactions amounting to about <coughs> close to 30 billion. That's well above the last five years average of 23 billion and the 15 billion that uh, happened last uh, 18, 15 billion that happened in 2018. Uh, the reasons that the, the, the companies are going to the market uh, now later this year is we haven't seen the yields as low as they are. If you look at the Brazil Treasury year yields in the beginning of the year was about five percent. Now it's around three seventy percent. You look at credit spreads at all time low, like uh, close to one ninety bips. Whereas like if you compare it to to early January it was like sixty bips higher. And also, like looking at the region of the overall, with all the political noises going on in Ecuador, Peru, Colombia, Chile, there is lack of opportunities like in, in emerging markets and in Latin America specifically. So we have seen a lot of appetite from investors in, in, in Brazil. Of 2020, I think it's going to be a little bit of the opposite uh, from 2019. We expect the year to start pretty busy with a lot of companies taking advantage of the end of the aging cycle. And, um, and as uh, the year evolves, uh, there will be more noise around and more volatility around the U.S. elections and until the recognition in the U.S. China trade, we've seen that probably volumes in the second half may slow down. To, to hear Jen speaking about how the international market evolved during the year, because in the local market it was pretty much the opposite. We start the year with some kind of uh, the, the, the market, the, the investors, the financial investors, not so comfortable with the new government. And on the other hand, the optimistic in Brazil was booming. Uh, a lot of fixed income investors, the market increasing a lot. If you look at the slide too, uh, here. We see how the market boom uh, from five years ago. Like five years ago, we had like the distribution. What is actually sold to fixed income investors? Most of fixed income, fixed income investors was 31 billion in 2015, and then you go to 2019, it was 120 billion up to now. So if you go to the end of the year, it will probably reach 140 billion. The new scenario for uh, interest rate in Brazil, what is happening actually in the last two months is that. Uh, the local hedge funds and asset managers, they have been facing a lot of withdrawals. So what you have been seeing is like prices are changing and also the size of the transactions are changing. So now, uh, as you can see, as we have told, we have been seeing like some companies that can see, oh, I have to go to the international market again because like the liquidity and the size of the transactions that I have in the uh, local market, uh, they are not the same as they used to be. In the in like six months. Uh, you know, yeah, we mentioned uh, in terms of the uh, importance of the domestic market, same tenor, big size as well, possibly a limitation in terms of, you know, uh, comparative size versus the still versus the international market, uh, obviously. But what um, I mean, if I if if uh, for let's say mid market 
uh, issuers that uh, are looking at accessing the capital markets uh, with their most of their their income and revenues and REIs. Is, is there really a choice between between the two? Um, I mean, what 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 other factors do you think? What what other factors um, switch? Um, uh, but uh, affect the decision on treasury for treasuries to, to where to do a placement. I think cost for sure is something that is important in Brazil. There is like uh, a U.S. interest rate mark, what we, which we call coupon market, and it has been trading at really really low historical levels. So when you swap the, the BRL issues back into U.S. dollar, it has been trading as I mentioned before really, really cheap when compared to the international market. That's one thing. But one thing that also, uh, when, when you go to longer tenors, it's complicated for them to do hash. So there are some companies that can assess like longer tenors, even 30 years here in the, in the, the international market, but there is not enough liquidity for them to head it back to BRL. And, and they can be like the most, uh, some of them, they are, they have all the, the revenues in BRL, so they had to do that. So. Sometimes even the liquidity in the in the dollar uh, BRL market is a complication for them to choose between the, the two markets. So they have to stay in the local market in order to have them to to be able to have the, the hedge perfectly done. And and also I think that the size. When you have a company in Brazil, for instance, with a gross debt of more than 15, 16 uh, billion BRL, you don't have enough liquidity. The, the, local SAM, the, the asset management, the market is pretty concentrated. You have like five big investors that have like 80% of the AUM from the market. So uh, if you have a, a, a considerable size of that in the local market, uh, 16 billion, you have to diversify your source of finance. You have to go to the international market in order to be, not to put all the eggs in, 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 in the same place. So there is something that uh, affects the decision for the issue. I, I would say that, you know, OPEC, Overall, we have a policy not to crowd out private investment. We have to be additional in everything that we're doing. Obviously, in Brazil, the needs are so vast that um, you know I would see OPEC or the DFC being very complementary to what capital markets or other banks or others are doing. Um, on the positive side, we have a lot of flexibility in terms of long tenors, in terms of large amounts, and obviously that those those amounts per project are even actually even getting larger um, with the new with the new cap that we have. And so, you know, I, I think um, I think that you know we, we very much see ourselves as wanting to be um, you know a key lender in, in large infrastructure projects, um, especially the, 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 the larger ones. Um, or where deals that that you know may not be the, the top names in, in Brazil. Um, are, are, have, a, have a good project that, that needs a, a bit of um, you know, investment and, and, and catalyzing from, from an investor like OPIC. And so, uh, you know, I, I see ourselves in either as a, as a direct lender or as, as with some of these new capabilities being able to, to work in capital markets and guaranteeing different entities now as, as very much complementary to what Brazil is looking for. Uh, next capital markets in Brazil is something very new. You know, it, it, we can say that it, it's less than 15 years yes, for sure. of, of market. And, uh, uh, and, and, and 2009 actually was a game changer for Brazil because until then, only listed companies could accept the game. For my slide, I have this number of issuers here. If you go and you see what Bruno was mentioning, like the numbers of first time issuers that you have in the market, this is slide number three. Next. We go like 2009 is when, sorry, uh, so 2009 was when the ruling 46, uh, 476 uh, was published. So you see how many first time issues you have in the local market. So it boomed because it was a simpler pro progress for the companies to, to access the market. So uh, the, 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 the local market is always uh, 10 steps behind the international market. But we are learning from them and we are evolving the local market in order to have better liquidity and, uh, and better size. Yeah, and I can vouch for that. We, the documentation evolved a lot if you compare to what we had like 10 years ago. And that was an interesting. So rule 476, what it did, it, it permitted unlisted companies to access the capital markets with very legal requirements. Basically having an audit 
uh, financial statement and complying with the uh, uh, rules regarding disclosure of material facts. Um, and that's helped a lot, right? And now the majority of the transactions actually are made under Rule 476. Only transactions that you really need to go to the retail markets are registered transactions. So uh, if you compare there, not too much transactions done in this way. And then I think three years ago, or, or a little bit more, the uh, CDM approved also for it to do equity transactions under 476. And now all the follow-ons in Brazil are made under this. Rule. You know that we know that CPM is looking at, and that would be very interesting for the domestic market. So one is the one that I mentioned before, that you know creation of these mechanisms that would allow uh, the recap or reopening of, of, of certain of, of insurances that were already registered, were already made. Uh, a set of rules that would apply to that issuances that would be more flexible compared to equity transactions. Um, uh, increase or release of the limitation of the number of investors in a 476 transaction. Um, and I think there, these are the main ones. Other things that we are seeing it would be good for the local capital markets is, is dollar denominated securities. So uh, we've seen in this, this year a detective branch in Brazil, they enacted a uh, provisional measure in which they uh, allowed the issuance of certain. Uh, uh, agribusiness titles, dollar denominated, and there are bills under discussion in Congress uh, to allow other securities to be dollar denominated, for instance, infrastructure debentures, that would be you know, very nice for the market. Um, Looking to the bond market, there are discussions as well uh, to exempt uh, uh, income tax on the payment of interest for both that, you know, uh, with the proceeds directed to infrastructure projects. And this is a proof certain that it's going to be used. There will be a lot of bond transactions using this type of, of a structure. Apart from that, only one thing I would say that private placement in Brazil, we don't have like the 4 HU as you have here in the US, so there is not a safe harbor for us to issue and do a private placement locally. This would, it would, it would help also for us to, to improve the local mm -hmm. and this is something that we don't have the, the same rule that like, the US has, but it's something that will help us on for a growth cycle now. And I see that there are a lot of projects in Brazil, not only in the infrastructure mm -hmm. sector that we already mentioned here, but also in the real estate sector. We have seen you know, international clients coming to the frame and understanding how they can invest in the real estate sector in Brazil. Agribusiness sector as well, there's a lot of activity, uh, particularly from, from Asian countries. And uh, FinTech is also that's something that's all in attention, and we have been working uh, with a lot of uh, international banks and non resident investors uh, on, on FinTech deals. And, and, and <coughs> for the domestic debt capital market, one, one, one thing that did not exist was a high yield market. So now uh, credit funds are being formed in Brazil and they are. Uh, seeking uh, seeking you know, lower risk with higher returns, uh, and, and, and this is something very new to the, to the Brazilian debt market. Um, so we believe this is going to, to become a trend uh, uh, next year. Um, so there's a lot of room for private debt in Brazil. Uh, perspective uh, as a lot of emerging markets economies. Um, so it was a political environment and how that can affect economic performance, investment interest. And Securities. Uh, in Brazil, you know, we moved past a lot of the anti corruption investigations that have happened. So, the point where there's a little more um, activity in terms of investor interest in that respect. The only thing is always equating Brazil to some of the other countries in Latin America, as the Juno mentioned. So, the neighbors may have the same level of political stability, and investors may view the, the region as a whole. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're bullish on Brazil moving forward. Uh, both in debt and in equity. The problem with the patrons in the local market was that they didn't have the expertise and they had the, uh, the sovereign bonds uh, with the yield necessary for them to reach their actuarial targets. So, what is happening now is that that doesn't happen anymore. And they are now trying to address that by two things. There is also one law that is trying to uh, bring the pension funds to the local ECM market by uh, giving the benefits to the issuer in order that they have like an extra tax shield if they issue an infrastructure debentures 
so in that case, they, the yield of the, the debate will be higher, and then the pension funds can reach the, the necessary return and, and will come to the market. So, and there is also a discussion with the, with the government in order to, to make those pension funds to hire uh, professional uh, asset managers in order to do all the, the studies necessary in order to, to buy credit. Because the thing is, in the past, they just buy uh, sovereign bonds and sometimes equity, but the equity also, they, they stop because of that history, blah, 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 etc. So now they, the market is pushing them a lot in order to, to, to come to the market and start buying fixed income insurance. But uh, uh, I agree with you. With BI, yeah, as you mentioned, uh, it's no longer so that much in confession. We see like all the DI transactions that we had in the market, they were not well known by investors. So there is for sure a migration for uh, inflation related transactions and uh, also for the region. So I think that this will happen soon. In 2020, probably, this, this will help. We see more patron funds we have been seen in the last transaction. So, there is also, they have like a specific legislation that, that, that they, they, the way that they can buy is still very limited, that they can have only 25% of each of the branches, they can, it has to be a, a, a listed company, so there is a lot of regulation that must be changed for them to come to the market, but we have been seeing the government and the regulators working on that, so I think we don't have any problem to come back to the market again. You have a restriction nowadays in Brazil for the uh, condition of rural and by foreign. Uh, and there are two types of, of collectors that you can mean that you can create over land in Brazil. One is a fiduciary bean, as I mentioned, uh, and the other is it's more, more similar to a market. It's not exactly but more similar to a market. Um, if you want, if you have a collector of mortgage, there is no pitfall. It works perfectly. The pitfall would, would, would be if you are, if you are forward, uh, uh, files for protection, uh, you would be subject to the procedure. Okay, then if you have a fiduciary union, you would be exempt for doing that procedure uh, as a general rule. Uh, but in order for you to foreclose a fiduciary union, you need to actually become the owner of the land. And there where there is a risk for a foreign, uh, we have been seeing uh, rules in favor of foreign creditors because animals of the foreign creditor is of course to foreclose itself if he's doing that because he wants to recover credits, not that he wants to become the permanent owner of the world. So there is a risk of discussion uh, which is not only legal but it's operational as well, let's say, because for you to transfer the property to your name, you need to go to the registry, of uh, real estate registry, and the real estate registry understanding that you are a non registered they refuse to do it. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you.